Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Emmy Vadness, co-host with Jeffrey Mishlove. Our topic today is mental health, consciousness, and the body. My guest is Dr. Thomas Verney, who's been a guest on New Thinking Aloud a previous time. He is a psychiatrist who founded the Association for Pre and Perinatal Psychology and Health and served as its president for eight years. He is author of nine books, including the Secret Life of the Unborn Child with John Kelly that's been published in 27 countries, Gifts of Our Fathers, Tomorrow's Baby, The Art and Science of Parenting from Conception Through Infancy, and The Embodied Mind, Understanding the Mysteries of Cellular Memory, Consciousness, and Our Bodies. Dr. Verney is located in Stratford, Ontario, and Canada, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Thomas. It's such a joy to have you back with us on New Thinking Aloud. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. The last time we spoke, we talked about the embodied quantum mind, and as a psychiatrist, you found in your research that the mind is both dependent and independent of the body. Currently, scientists believe, uh, and that, that applies to, I think, most uh, neuroscientists, that the mind is an epiphenomenon. In other words, just a function of the brain. Uh, now, that means that the mind is really no different, let's say, from the kidneys. The kidneys produce urine. Urine is an epiphenomenon of the kidneys. Bile is an epiphenomenon of the gallbladder. The mind is an epiphenomenon of the brain. Now, obviously, you know, I mean, any normal person who just thinks about this analogy will find it nonsensical. I mean, there is no way that the mind can be compared to urine or, or bile uh, because those substances can be seen, they can be measured. Uh, we know where they are. We know what they look like. They can be quantified. The mind cannot. Uh, so the mind really is different from uh, material matter, so to speak. Uh, it is immaterial. And, you know, one of the problems, one of the problems with science is that for a long time, it has been very deterministic and very materialistic. And so it's all about quantifying, qualifying, measuring. And things that really matter, as you well know, <laughs> are not quantifiable and not measurable. Love cannot be measured, beauty cannot be measured, and the mind certainly cannot be measured. So, you know, there are actually a number of philosophers, psychologists, uh, who, who believe that the mind is more than just a product of the brain. I think the brain is necessary. I'm not minimizing the function of the brain. I think that we need it, but we also need the rest of the body because the brain is not, and this is one of the main points of my book, the brain is not separate from the body. And a lot of, a lot of neuroscientists act as if the brain was like outside the body almost, like it's, a, it's, it's another person. It acts on its own, and that is so untrue. Uh, it's just totally untrue. And so some of that, I think, is also due to our culture, you know. For a long time, probably even before the Greek culture, um, we have gone down sort of the road of, uh, of putting emphasis on leadership. And the leadership always comes from the head. It's the head honcho, okay, the head of the tribe, uh, who is heading this particular research project. It's always about the head. We have become sort of totally uh, fallen in love with the brain and, 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 and the head. 
And that has also then led to this very hierarchical kind of a structure in our society. And science has kind of imitated that. So even in science, all the emphasis has always been on the head. Um, I, uh, I attended Harvard University. I get the Harvard University newsletter every week. And in one of the newsletters, for example, they talked about the importance uh, of the connection between the brain and the gut. So I thought, oh boy, finally, you know, Harvard has entered the 21st century. And then they go on in their newsletter to say how uh, anxiety and stress can affect the gut. And absolutely nothing about how the gut microbiome, in other words, all the viruses and bacteria, which we carry about five pounds in our gut, influence the brain. It's all about top down and nothing about bottom up. So I think, once again, we need to connect the gut, the heart, and brain, and all the other cells in our bodies. And, you know, people have talked about psychosomatic medicine, for example, for a long time. But it's, it's just a word. Uh, they have really not understood the concept totally, because to them, psychosomatic medicine means only the influence of the psyche on the soma. In other words, the mind and the body, and nothing about the body and, and the mind. So I think a lot of the research that I cite in my book uh, goes exactly to prove that point, that bottom up is just as important as top down. How much do you feel consciousness impacts the body versus the body impacting consciousness? Consciousness is a very complex um, phenomenon, issue, word. Um, there, there are millions of books, perhaps millions is a bit of an overstatement, but I would say probably hundreds of books written on consciousness. And everybody has got sort of a different interpretation of what consciousness is. Um, I, I think that most people agree that Consciousness involves a sense of self. So I know who I am. I know I'm sitting here talking to you. That is consciousness. Um, but when we get to unconsciousness, things get even really complicated, you know. When we are sleeping, are we unconscious? Are we partially conscious? Um, near death experiences, um, the brain totally stops working, the heart stops working. And yet when people come back from having been dead for all intents and purposes, they can tell you in many instances what happened while they were dead. So how does that work? I don't have the answer, but I know I know that there is more to it than, again, you know, just the functioning of the brain. So um, I think that the mind, which I feel more comfortable about talking because at least I have an idea of what that is, um, I think the mind is incredibly powerful. And one of the things I think that people need to realize is, that really how you think, how you think about yourself, for example, will influence who you are. There's a wonderful sort of research project on 82 maids in New York, and uh, half, of them, half of them were told that their work, their everyday work, just cleaning up rooms and stuff like that, really lives up to uh, the Surgeon General's uh, sort of um, what is it? I always forget. A recommendation, yes, for uh, daily exercise, yes. So the other 41 were not told anything like that. At the end of 30 days, measurements were made, blood pressure measurements, circumference of um, the abdomen, um, heart rate, all kinds of measurements were taken on both groups of maids. 
the maids who believed that they were exercising had a wonderful drop in blood pressure. All their measurements improved in a positive direction, although they did not do anything different from what the other maids were doing. And so, you know, what you think really, really can make a huge uh, difference in, in your life. And so it is so important for people, our listeners, people in general, to realize that if you have, for example, low self-esteem, um, you should do something about that because it will definitely um, shorten your lifespan, uh, increase your health problems, uh, decrease your success in life, decrease your success in relationships. I mean, all of that, you know, hangs on how you think and feel about yourself. Mm -hmm. Many people deal with significant stress, anxiety, yeah. depression, normal grief and loss. It sometimes gets termed as depression. Yeah. That can really impact them and even trauma back to childhood with adverse childhood experiences. Yeah. How can someone heal from those and improve their self-esteem? Or what are some of the ways you have found as a psychiatrist that can help people? I think there are many different ways of doing that. Um, obviously, you know, going to see a therapist if your if your issues are major, uh, going to see a therapist, psychologist, psychiatrist, counselor. Uh, as long as the person, as long as the person is empathic, and uh, have had you know some some therapy of their own, I think that really makes a difference and uh, they've had a good education, all those things make a difference. So seeing someone, another person, um, a, a professional can be very helpful. Uh, but short of that, there are many other things that you can do. I mean, obviously, talking to your friends and asking them, you know, simple questions. Why do you like me? Uh, why do you have me as a friend? Uh, what what qualities in me um, do you admire uh, or appreciate? Uh, and then you can tell them what you appreciate about them. I think being open and honest is the first step, whether it's with a therapist or whether it's with a friend. Um, I think that can be incredibly healing. The worst thing you can do is try to sort of wall off your trauma or your low self-esteem or whatever it is that's bothering you and act as if there was nothing wrong with you. That really takes me to the next step, which is being honest with yourself. You know, like, don't try to fool yourself. You know, like, here you are. You have changed jobs about five times during the last six months. You always get fired. People don't like you because you're late or lazy. Well, perhaps it's time to stop and think about, you know, what am I doing? What am I doing with my life? You know, I'm ruining my life. I'm ruining everybody around me, especially if you are married. Really looking into the mirror, so to speak, um, metaphorically speaking, uh, looking into the mirror and seeing yourself as you really are. You know, stop kidding yourself. If you are not successful, if you're anxious, if you're depressed, what's going on? And don't blame other people for your problems. Don't blame, you know, the economy or, you know, the governing party or the government or whatever, you know, look to what you can do uh, to improve yourself. I may add, you know, practically speaking, I think exercise is very important. I think being out in nature is incredibly important. Uh, there is much, much research to show that nature is very healing. Okay, taking hikes, going into the mountains, swimming, uh, playing sports, all those things are very, very important. Uh, 
your gut bacteria are very important. There is so much research nowadays on the significance of a healthy, diverse bacterial flora in your gut. A lot of drugs, for example, which are given uh, to cure, heal, help depression, uh, don't work. And they don't, about one third of patients who receive antidepressants don't benefit from them. And the reason that they don't benefit from them is not that there's anything wrong with the drug, uh, but the point is that they have gut bacteria, and, and research has shown this, they have gut bacteria which destroy that particular antidepressant. And that's why they don't benefit from it. But nobody is paying attention to that. Mm. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just such a tragedy uh, that um, most doctors have not awakened to the importance of gut of gut bacteria. So in terms of, you know, improving your life, I think being with other people, being social is also very important. I mentioned exercise. I mentioned nature. Um, having interests is very important. Um, people, if I may use um, my own case, you know, people often wonder, you know, like, how old are you? You know, and when I tell them, they say, no, no, not possible. You know, you look like 70. Actually, I'm 86. Wow, Thomas. I'm 86. And, you know, I'm as busy as I have ever been in my life, honestly, you know. And I think that, you know, one of the, one of the reasons, I mean, genetics obviously has something to do with it. But one of the reasons is because I have so many interests. You know, I don't go out and golf five days a week uh, like so many people who retire do that. And by the way, I'm not retired. I still see patients. And, you know, we do these podcasts and I write books and I write articles and uh, I'm involved in many, many, many things in the community. And so I think that, you know, um, I am, I'm, walking the walk, as they say, you know, talking the talk and walking the walk. And so I, I do all the things that I have just advised uh, people to do. I, I practice what I preach. Those are all wonderful suggestions. With the gut bacteria, what are some ways that people can improve that? Yes. Uh, there are many, many ways. One way, of course, is through healthy eating and eating lots of diverse foods, and also eating things like yogurt, or um, sauerkraut, or pickles that have been in brine, like eating um, kaffir, e eating Greek yogurt, uh, eating things that contain live bacteria. And if you have problems with that, or if you want to be really, really sure, you can always take a probiotic. Uh, which you can buy uh, in any drugstore. There are millions of those now. And I take one probiotic a day, and in the morning I have, uh, I have yogurt with fresh fruit. Mm -hmm. And so, and try to have a very diverse, um, di diverse diet. Uh, particularly older people tend to sort of eat the same thing over and over and over again because it's simple to make. Uh, many people live, you know, on toast, uh, uh, on toast and jam or something like that. Well, you know, nothing could be worse than that. And, <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, and perhaps coffee, which in small amounts is fine, but in large amounts, like everything else, is not very healthy. So I think that's, that's what people can do. Probiotics and diverse foods, and especially foods that contain live bacteria, uh, that is good. And uh, not, too much, not too much red meat. Um, and, so, and, and lots of fish, if you can. Uh, essentially a Mediterranean diet, everybody seems to recommend that, which is why I'm going to the Mediterranean on Saturday. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, yes, fantastic. You also mention in your book that there seems to be 
mm, intergenerational trauma that can impact us? How can we heal from that? Yeah, that's a, that's a very, very big problem. You know, when you look at the world and you see, for example, what's happening in Ukraine at the moment, uh, I think something like 7 million people have fled. Uh, there are 7 million refugees. There are refugees from Syria. There are refugees from Afghanistan. Uh, the world is filled with refugees. Now, these refugees, sooner or later, are going to have children. And these children will, will carry the trauma of their parents uh, in, in, their, in their bodies, in their body minds. And so this is, this is a big problem because stress does affect the ovum and the sperm. And so when uh, a woman or man who have been stressed, particularly, you know, by these huge uh, conflagrations that we are witnessing nowadays, and of course, you know, it goes back like, many, many thousands of years. You know, there have always been wars. There have always been uh, groups that have been um, suppressed and persecuted. So um, when, uh, when a sperm from a man or an ovum from a woman who, who have been stressed and, and, and really stressed, like I'm not talking about, you know, being late for the cinema or something like that, like we are talking major major stresses, traumas, really, you know, when your life is in danger, when there is hunger, um, when you have that kind of traumatic experience, that will carry on into the next generation, and sometimes three or four more generations down the line. Uh, this has been, again, proven over and over again uh, in much research uh, with animals and with human beings. Uh, children of Holocaust survivors, for example, have been studied uh, by Dr. Yehuda in New York. Uh, and they all show that, that the children will suffer. Uh, they will be less resistant to stress. Uh, there is a popular myth that stress makes you, the stress makes you stronger. It is not true. It is not true. Uh, just like a broken leg may heal, but it will not be stronger as a result. There will always be, you know, a, a weakness, a, a, a weak point in, in, that, in that bone. So it's the same thing with stress. Uh, you become actually less resistant to stress. Also, the parenting will suffer. So if the parents have been traumatized, uh, their parenting styles, will will suffer and they will um, you know be more anxious um, they will be um, less patient with their kids um, so that will then also in a psychological way uh, influence the children uh, they may also either, either talk too much about the trauma or shut down and not talk about it at all and so there is this feeling of a big secret in the family that nobody talks about, you know, the elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. And uh, nobody, nobody talks about it. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's really significant. And uh, the world is now filled with children of survivors of persecution. Uh, whether it's uh, in the United States, for example, you know, the, in, the indigenous people um, that we used to call Indians, right? Um, First Nations in, in Canada. Uh, in Canada, we have, had, we have had residential schools. You may have heard of those. I think you may have had them in the United States, too. Um, so we have had residential schools where people have suffered physical and sexual abuse almost daily uh, when these people grow up and they become parents well they you know they lack parenting skills because they never experience parenting from their parents so it's just being passed on so both genetically and psychologically it's kind of a double whammy you know it does not look good for for children of um, of, of people 
like that, and they need they need a lot of help. Uh, and and one of the things that they can do is get help in a social environment. Uh, that is very helpful. So when you have when you have perhaps groups where indigenous people can meet, or where your Ukrainian refugees can meet and they can support each other, uh, that can be more helpful than individual therapy. Because being with someone who who knows what it feels like to have been persecuted, to have been a refugee, uh, and all those other things that come with it, um, you just have more trust in a person like that, and you listen to what they have to say. And, and, and sharing your pain and your grief really can be very helpful. I mean, there, there is a reason that psychology and psychotherapy exist, uh, because, you know, in the right hands, it can be very, very healing. It seems that separation, lack of love and abandonment can really yes. cause the trauma and the pain and the grief and the loss. And like, like you mentioned with the social connection, that that mm-hmm. love, connection, and bonding can be healing. Yes. So that is a very important aspect of healing, is, is to connect with other people who have been in a similar situation. I mean, that's why Alcoholic Anonymous, for example, works, and all those 12-step programs, because you're sitting and, and, and sharing with people who have had similar problems. So, you know, they're... There are a lot of groups who work on that basis. And then a person can experience perhaps non-judgment, maybe even unconditional acceptance, yes. and maybe even unconditional love. Yes, yes. Well, that is an ideal. Um, I think that practically speaking, not many of us are sort of Mother Teresa's. And, uh, you know, we have, we have all had experiences. We have all been traumatized in one way or another. You know, there's not a person in the world who has not had, you know, some put down, some criticisms, uh, some hurts. Um, I mean, just to mention a small one, you know, in one class, I think when I was very young, uh, I was in a choir and, uh, we were, learning a song and the teacher turned to me and said just open your mouth don't sing you have a deaf ear or whatever the expression is right um so at that moment i gave up singing you know i never sang again never 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 sang again for 20 or 30 years just that one comment right it just cuts you in half yeah So what I'm saying is all of us have had that. All of us have had multiple, multiple times when we have been somehow put down, criticized. Um, And so, you know, we we carry these scars, and it's very difficult for us to be totally loving, uh, you know, unconditionally, as you said, you know, unconditionally loving. But I think we need to try. And we need to really take it easy on judgments and making assumptions about about people. Um, I, I live in a town in Stratford, which is uh, famous for its uh, Shakespearean festival. And, you know, so I go to a lot of plays. Um, and I'm, I'm the psychiatric consultant to the festival. And, uh, you know, Sometimes I sit down and after about 10 minutes, after the performance started, after about 10 minutes, some person will rush in and, and, you know, sit down in front of me or something like that. And I'm thinking, what's the matter with those people? Can't they be on time? And then you find out, you know, that they were in an accident or their kid, you know, uh, needed to see a doctor or something like that. And it wasn't their fault. And, you know, I made assumptions which were wrong. And so we, we, you know, I keep telling myself to be a better person, but it's not easy. (laughs) Yeah. Well, maybe we can all have more moments of awareness of being more not judging to ourselves and others and perhaps being unconditionally accepting 
Uh, and like you say, that there's often more to the story than we realize what's going on for people. Right, exactly. Yes. Yes. So, you know, we, we have to try. And, uh, and, you know, coming back to the beginning of our discussion, I think it's important to realize that we have to sort of try it with our whole body. You know, it's not just in the head um, that, you know, I mean, the Greeks had a saying, uh, healthy mind in a healthy body. And boy, were they right. You know, I mean, that is just so true. You cannot have a healthy mind unless you have, you know, a relatively healthy body. And so in in terms of, you know, takeaways from our discussion, I think it's important for people to realize that they need to take good care of their bodies. Mm-hmm. You know, taking care of your body is taking care of your mind. And so if you don't want to be depressed and if you don't want to be anxious and you don't want to suffer obsessive compulsive disorders and all the other things that you know, people um, suffer of mentally, emotionally, uh, take better care of your body because the two are connected. Thomas, what does a psychiatrist do as a consultant at a Shakespearean festival? (laughs) Well, um, there are, you know, uh, we have a huge number of people who work for the festival. Um, we uh, We have something like a thousand people who work here in one capacity or another. We have four theaters that are going on during the summer. Uh, We have stage hands. We have hatters. uh, We have dressers. uh, 120 actors. But those 120 actors are supported by another thousand people behind behind the stage, so to speak. And so every one every once in a while, one of them gets emotionally sick, uh, and also so. And they need someone who, who is able to see them right away. I mean, you know, from your own experience, I am sure uh, that it's not easy to get an appointment nowadays with a psychiatrist or psychologist. Uh, certainly, here in Canada, might take six to eight months before you can get even a consultation. Um, when they call me from the theater, uh, I'm available like instantly. Uh, so that is what I do sometimes um but also um when they have problems with plays um when when you have problems um in term, well take a play like hamlet you know uh which which have uh, where hamlet has huge psychological issues issues with his mother issues is trying to revenge his father um sometimes actors sometimes when they are playing um when they are playing uh, roles like that it triggers some of their own uh unconscious um issues Mm -hmm. and so suddenly you know they may want to see someone and talk about it so all those things uh come up and uh, and i enjoy working with actors and uh and sort of people who are you know into into exploring new horizons and um, being very active. Um, so uh, artistic people, I enjoy, um, you know, being creative myself. Um, I can usually connect with them easily. So, yeah, that's what I do. That's a beautiful role you're providing. And, yes, I have heard here in the United States that it can take up to six months or more to see a psychiatrist or a psychologist, which is why I wanted to have this conversation with you here today to help people who may not be able to get the access that they might need. Well, I I appreciate the opportunity. And I I just want to say that it is so easy to talk to you. it's, It's just, you know, like having a conversation in my home. It's very, you make it very easy. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you so much, Thomas. Candace Pert, who wrote the book Molecules of Emotion, said that the body is the subconscious of the mind. Do you agree with that? No, I, do, I don't think the body is the subconscious of the mind. Um, I think I, I think the whole idea of the unconscious, the subconscious, and the conscious is very complicated. Uh, like we said at the beginning, you know, we 
we don't have a seat for it. We don't know where it's located. Um, and it is not, you know, like blood or lymph nodes or, you know, your liver. Like we know where those things are. We can see them. Nobody has seen the unconscious. I mean, this is purely um, a, a, a creature of, of Freud's. And um, I guess in a way it was like the when the Greeks started talking about atoms, like nobody in Greece ever saw an atom, but they had this concept, which was totally correct, and, and I totally believe, by the way, in the Freudian conscious and unconscious, but I don't believe that it is sort of in one particular, excuse me, in one particular place. Uh, just like, you know, the Greeks thought of atoms as the smallest possible particle. So actually, I think that the metaphor that one of the Greek scientists who came up with this idea uh, provided was that if you cut a melon into smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller pieces, finally you get to the point where you can cut it no more. That's the atom. That's what they call the atom, which is a great idea. It's fantastic. Nobody saw it, um, and, but they, they were on the right path. So I think it's similar a little bit to the unconscious, you know. Uh, it's it's just sort of a speculative um, formulation of how our mind works. And certainly things that we have experienced, but which are not accessible to consciousness. Uh, you know, what did I do on my second birthday, you know, when I was two years old? Where was I? What did I do? It is not accessible. I don't know. But it is in there somewhere. Um, and I don't know where it is, but I guess, you know, it must be in my cellular being. So I think it's, it's probably in all the cells of my body. And I think of it, uh, like perhaps the best analogy that I can come up with is like, think, think of it, think of an orchestra. Think of the New York Symphony, 120 musicians, uh, one conductor, and each musician plays an instrument. And some of them play the drum, some of them play, you know, the violin, whatever. When you sit in the audience, you hear only one sound. You don't hear 120 instruments. They all coalesce. They all work together. That's how I think the mind works, okay? That it takes all this information from the billions of cells in our bodies. I think that the brain sort of is like the conductor. It helps to sort of transform all those singular sounds or memories into one whole unit. And so I think that Rather than the body being the unconscious, the body is everything. It's the conscious, the subconscious, and the unconscious. It's all in there. And um, after our death, of course, which is always an interesting question, right? You know, what happens to all that? Um, well, perhaps some of your other, other guests may have an answer to that. I don't, but I... But I do feel that there may be some kind of consciousness existing after, after death. I think that I don't think that the mind totally perishes and disappears. Uh, I think something remains and perhaps it sort of joins the larger consciousness that exists in the universe. Our very own Jeffrey Mishlove, who is the host and producer of New Thinking Aloud, recently won the Bigelow Institute for Consciousness Studies essay on the best evidence for the continuation of consciousness in the afterlife in 2021. Oh, I would like to see that. How can I access that? Yeah. So if you go to the Bigelow Institute for Consciousness Studies website, okay, there's a 
page there that lists all of the essays that won. He was the grand prize winner, but there were also a total of, I believe, 29 winning essays um, from people around the world, leading figures in parapsychology, consciousness, and the continuation of, of consciousness and the afterlife. Will do. I recently spoke with Dr. David Hanscom, who is a retired spine surgeon, who found that a majority of his chronic pain patients were really suffering from anxiety, what he terms intrusive thoughts, uh, and that it was impacting their bodies. I also had the good pleasure to talk with Matthew McKay, who is a psychologist, and they both independently of each other talked about how suppressed thoughts and emotions can really wreak havoc on our consciousness and our bodies. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree. I agree. Yes, I, I, I think that I referred to that actually about half an hour ago when we talked about what people can do uh, when they have been traumatized. And um, I suggested that one of, the, one, of the, one of the things they can do is to admit to themselves that they have been traumatized and then open up about it. Yeah, a lot of people don't want to feel the emotions. And I think myself working as a therapist, I found and me being a human that we collectively, a lot of people want to avoid the pain, the emotional or physical pain. Obviously, if there's, you know, get professional help, of course, to make rule out anything significant. Um, sure. But there's a concern sometimes with people that they might get stuck in the emotional yeah. pain. Yes, yes. No, I can understand that. And, uh, and, and I can understand the reluctance and the resistance to going uh, where you know you're going to experience pain. But, you know, this is one of those times in life where perhaps some temporary pain uh, will really pay off in the long run. And, uh, you know, it's, it, I mean, it, in a way, it's like exercise. You know, sometimes you just don't feel like going out there because it's cold or it's raining or you feel that the, well, for whatever reason, you don't want to do it. Uh, but, it's important to force yourself. It's important to force yourself because you know that you need it and that it's good for you. Mm -hmm. And so that's what makes the difference between people who are healthy and successful. Uh, and I don't just mean financially, of course. I, I mean successful in their relationships, uh, successful in being good people, uh, that they are, that they are willing to put up with some pain, with some difficulties in life, and willing to put in the work to overcome uh, those barriers. I think mindfulness really shines in that area of a practice of being able to observe yourself, your thoughts and emotions as best you can from a place of non-judgment and just sort of letting whatever happens happen and uh, yeah. being able to bring compassion, that self-compassion to yourself. Exactly. Yes, you put it beautifully. There's research that shows that ESP, telepathy, being able to feel people's emotions, no thoughts at a distance is a very real phenomena. How much do you feel people's mental health is being impacted by others? You mean at a distance? Or, or when in the same family or in the same room or by friends, like, could you be a little bit more exact? Yes, all of that, psychically, picking up on it as the collective oneness that we do bleed into each other. Well, um, I think that some people are more sensitive to those kinds of influences than others. Um, and you yourself, uh, I remember, uh, you teach people, for example, how to become more sensitive, how to become um, more open to feeling the pain of another person. Um, and so I think that you can practice that. And some people naturally are more easily influenced than others. Um, some people are more open than others to those influences. But generally speaking, yes, I think that you can be very much influenced by other people. And it's one of the reasons 
that it's so important uh, to surround yourself by good people. Um, there are, I have known a lot of patients who would forever try to win the favor of a father or a mother who they felt never liked them. And they spend their lives, you know, trying to make a father, mother, sister, a stranger, uh, make them like you. And that is such a waste of time. Surround yourself by people who like you instead of by people who don't like you. And don't try to get into clubs that they that don't want you as a member. Um, you know, uh, don't waste your time on, on climbing these these walls, uh, which are just too high and too greasy, and you will never get to the top. So, you know, I think it's very, very important to surround yourself by good people, people who are friendly, people who like you, even if it's just two or three. Uh, you know, you don't need hundreds of people who like you. In fact, there's probably something wrong with you if you have hundreds of people liking you. Um, but uh, yes, I, I think that we can be influenced. You know, there are just so many examples that I can think of where you can be influenced for the better or for worse. I will just give you one example. Um, like if there is this experiment that Gene Robinson um, did on on um, on bees and uh, what he did was he had uh, he had two uh, hives of bees one was uh, what are called african killer bees and I, I mentioned that in my book and the other ones are european sort of much milder bees and what he did with the help of some of his uh, students was to take uh, something like 300 newly born bees from one hive and put them into the other hive and vice versa. And then what he noticed was that within a very short time, uh, the bees that came from, let's say, the African killer bees and were put into the hive of the milder European bees became milder. And the, Afri and, uh, the mild bees that were born to mild families, uh, when they were put into the hive of the killer bees, became just like them, much more aggressive. And then we, when he looked at the genetic material, also the expression of their genes changed as a result of the environment. And, and think about that. Think about that about when you take that, for example, into a lynching mob. Okay. Think what happens to people who are sort of, or, or take Take your January 6th, you know, event uh, in Washington, right? When you're surrounded by people who are aggressive and screaming and yelling, even if you're not to begin with, you become like them. This is, this is incredibly, it's an incredibly important piece of research and uh, largely unknown to most people, but it certainly, you know, supports uh, supports the hypothesis that other people can have a huge influence over you. Uh, well, and that, that's why, you know, Trump has got his big rallies and Hitler had, had his big rallies, right? Because when you have 10,000 people yelling, seek Heil or something like that, well, you know, you change as a result of that, even if you were not a believer. Uh, the expression of your genes, your epigenome changes and you become like them and so you know draw your own conclusions <laughs> that's a big word can you briefly describe the epigenome yes uh so the you know for for a long time up to about 30 or 40 years ago people believed that genes are your destiny you know that when you're born i don't know when you're born uh, with genes for brown eyes you will develop brown eyes and that is true but uh, people also believe that you may be born, let's say, a, a schizophrenic or with uh, tendencies to anxiety, neurosis, all that kind of stuff. That is not true. 
you may be born with tendencies to all those things that I just described, but unless that particular gene is turned on, you will not become whatever that gene might sort of indicate you should become. In other words, you know, you may never develop, let's say, cancer of the lungs, although you may have the gene for it unless you smoke, unless you are exposed to toxic environment, toxic fumes. You know, if you live in the center of the city and you breathe in every day, you know, all the carbon dioxide and all the toxins in the air, uh, then that particular uh, switch that turns on the cancer the cancer gene uh, will be activated and you will get cancer. So what we have found out in the study of the epi epigenome and epigenetics is that the environment really has a huge influence on uh, what will happen to your genes. So it's not the genes, it's really the switches. And um, Robert Sapolsky, who is a very famous professor in California, has uh, written a wonderful book, uh, which is called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. And in it, he, t he tells us that it, it, the genome is like 95% made up of switches and only 5% of genes. And it's those switches which consist, which determine what will happen to you in, in life in terms of illnesses and uh, whether you will develop your musical talent, for example, or not, all those things uh, develop, you know, depend on the switches. Yeah. And stress can really impact if those switches are flipped or not as well. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Stress. Yeah. Dr. Thomas Verney, thank you so much for all that you shared with us today. I've truly enjoyed our conversation and, and we really appreciate everything you've shared with us. Thank you, and it was truly a pleasure. Thank you very much for having me on. And for those of you listening or watching, thank you for being with us. Mm -hmm.